So what's currently going on with Machine Head? Machine Head are currently auditioning bass players. We are uh, Adam and us. We, I mean, basically, he's not in the band anymore. So we're going through the process of auditioning some dudes. We, uh, anybody see any YouTube clips up there that we did? Yeah, yeah okay. Actually, you did? Yeah. Yes, you did. Yeah, you did, man. So, you know, had like 300 people kind of audition online. And uh, thank you for your time and your effort. You know, we appreciate everybody. So we, um, we narrowed it down to seven guys. And we had uh, our fifth guy out yesterday. And we're, uh, it's a hard process. Anybody out there in a band? Anybody out there lose a member and you had to audition for more? Anybody out there have fun doing it? Nobody. <laughs> Exactly. Said no one ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever, right. So it's, it's a hard deal. Um, he was a fixture in the band, and we're just trying to find a guy to play the Mayhem Tour right now. And uh, we'll take it from there. Looking for somebody long term, but for now, we're in the midst of writing a record. Right. So we want to uh, find somebody to fill in that tour. We kind of took the tour on like, yeah, it's Mayhem. It's... Mario's doing it. It's his first tour ever. Yep. <laughs> thrown, thrown into exile, right? Yes. It's all downhill from the Mayhem tour, right. man. You <laughs> yeah, I mean, how cool is it that my first tour ever gets to be one of my favorite bands? Yeah. Seriously. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. But the Mayhem tour is it's summer debauchery, and just it's, it's the best festival tour put together. So for him to be able to do that on your first tour, it's amazing. So um, it's... it's it's an honor, man, yeah. but just like, don't think that you're going out on tour every day. and It's going to be like the Mayhem tour. Well, it's just luxury right now. <laughs> so, but we want to get through this tour and get back to writing, get back in the studio in October and start uh, writing, getting the new Machine Head record out. Nice. How do you feel social media you know, played a huge role as far as the search like, on the bass player? Yeah, the YouTube thing was something that Rob kind of came up with because they had audition drummers for when uh, Chris Contos went out. And so um, Dave has been in the band for, man, almost 19 years now. And so when Logan left, they had auditioned guitar players. And after Aru left, they didn't have to audition anybody because I just kind of came in and it kind of worked out. I'm sure you'll get to that at some point. But yeah. um, so the audition process is just pain. Can I curse? Absolutely. Okay, so the <laughs> the audition process is a pain in the fucking ass, and so Rob was thinking, okay, let's we need to filter through, and we need to be able to look at everybody and give everybody a chance. So, um, if anybody's a Machine Head fan out there, okay, yeah. so you know we're a pretty pretty accessible band, and we're pretty um, we're street level guys. I'm blue collar guys. I'm still a carpenter union holding. Carrier, you know, and the card card carrier. What I'm gonna misspeak so much tonight, so it's not even gonna be funny at one point. So chalk that up for number one, bang. <laughs> but we're blue collar guys. We're a blue collar band, and we really relate because without our fans, we're nothing. You know, we're fans of music as well, and we need, you know, we're, it's all reciprocal. We need you guys, and we enjoy you guys. We enjoy metal is such a, it's not a genre of music to us. It's it's a family and a brotherhood. You know, we, we need each other to survive. So we, we felt, man, there are so many people out there that can play. Let's look at everybody that we can. They have to sing as well, you know. So uh, open it up to that field. And we've got two or three, pretty much un three or four unknown guys that are going to jam with the band. Nice. So it's, you have to utilize the technology that's available today. That's awesome. Um <laughs> Going back to the beginning of Mayhem Fest, because I know you guys were direct support on the second stage, and then you guys came back in 2011. How does it feel to be headlining the second stage this year? Um, we actually closed the, the second stage the first year. That's right. We're okay. the last yeah, band. It was back for with uh, Five Finger. I can't remember if Five mm -hmm. Finger was doing one of the stages. Yeah, one of the stages. But okay. we were always the last band on the second mm -hmm. stage to go. Mm -hmm. And as Mayhem has evolved, we've kind of picked, well, this is the cooler spot to be in. And... We were able to headline or uh, to open the main stage for a bit of 2011, and 
that can be a bummer sometimes, man, you know, because you're, you're getting there and people are still getting their nachos and who's this, what, what's the name of their band? You know, something head anyway, you know, and sometimes <laughs> eating the hot dogs. And, but I mean, a lot of the shows are really good. Uh, but for the most part, you know, like I said, we, we want to be down with everybody. We want to see the circle pits. We want people coming up and slapping hands and doing all that. So we prefer the second stage. Nice. Let's talk about your beginnings as a guitar. It's like, what made you pick up a guitar? <laughs> um, way back in the Depression. <laughs> 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 My wife bugs me all the time, like, hey, what was it like during the Great Depression? Or, you know, what was FDR like as a president? And, um, there's a, can you see the tattoo? Gene Simmons and Kiss. Uh, not Gene Simmons, but the Demon, all right? Uh, Kiss was a band that I got into. I had a, um, my cousin lived next door to me, cousin Ron, and he was three or four years older than me, and he was like the older brother that had, you know, all the cool records that I would get into. It was, it was like Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and ACDC, but he had Kiss Alive 1, and I saw these guys breathing fire and spitting blood, and, you know, and they rocked. So it's like, Meanwhile, I want to be in a band. Meanwhile, as a kid, you see, they're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, exactly. It scared the shit out of my parents who were, they're bringing me up as a Christian in a little suburban neighborhood, you know, and, and they're like, hey, do you saw, <laughs> I remember my dad, I had a Kiss Army fort underneath our little swimming pool, you know, and I went out of there and I had the Kiss Army stuff up there and used to steal cigarettes from the local 7-Eleven and go down and smoke. I was in like the fourth grade or something crazy like that. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so he would go, you know, of course, as a dad, a good dad would do, he'd go down there and see what's going on. And right. He's seeing like Gene Simmons' uh, Gene, his letters, like say, you know, talking to all, talking dirty to ladies. He's all, what are you into? You know, who are these guys? The demon and the cat dude and the space dude? And, and um, he recognized at an early age that, I just came back with, dude, you know, it's all made up, Dad. You know, they're just, you know, it's fiction. Like, I was able to differentiate between what's real and what they're doing for show. And Right, it's just a show. So they really cultivated me playing music. Um, my mom was in a folk group. You know, she sang in the choir, which I thought was pretty hip back in the day because the guys had guitars, and I called them the players, you know, because they played. And... Um, so they cultivated me in the music. They really encouraged it. And um, what, that's what I think about this is every, you know, all you guys, I, is there anybody under 21 in here? That's amazing that you guys are, how, do, do you guys attend the school here? How cool is this place that you're able to come here and do this? <laughs> it's totally dope, dude. Class is not a session. You guys can get a little rowdy. It's all good. <laughs> so... Having that being nurtured at home and, and seeing my mom, you know, and having the piano there and having music around so much was, it really helped. Uh, my dad could not sing a lick. You know, we'd be in church and he would just be so off key. And that's how I learned what singing off key sounds like from my dad in church. <laughs> you know, it's just like I'd be cringing him and sometimes it'd just be so bad I'd like elbow him and he's just like, all right, I'll just mouth the words. It's okay. And where was I going with this? What was the question? What made you pick up a guitar? <laughs> what made me, okay, original question. So just having that, having that influence from my parents, you know, it wasn't really Kiss who um, made me want to play guitar, it made me want to be in a band, and we'd put on the makeup and have the tennis racket guitars and, you know, put smoke bombs on the, the end of the tennis rackets and be in full makeup, and we had records back then, so we were spinning the record, and it was playing, and for the finale, we'd all jump in the pool, you know? That was our big Kiss show. That's and, awesome. Uh, but the guy that made me want to play guitar was Angus Young of ACDC. He was, uh, as I would come to um, really appreciate about music, is the players that emote through their instrument. And Angus was a player where... You know, I love ACDC is probably my favorite band. If that's that, you know, the proverbial question, you know, name one band who's you could have the discography on, a, on an island, you know, who, what would your band be? Only one band. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's between Slayer and Kiss. All right. Mine's ACDC. 
you know, it's, it's not really political, it's just about, you know, being sad, being mad, being happy, and you hear that in Angus's playing. I mean, you know when he's pissed off, or you know when he's, you know, right on the, just the slow, bluesy solos that he's sad, and you know, and he's hammered, you know? <laughs> you, you know when, what he's feeling. So Angus Young made me want to pick up a guitar. Now let's go to, uh, back to the LA, um, early Bay Area thrash. How did violence come about? <laughs> um, well, back in 1985, <laughs> I was graduating high school. And I had, uh, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. So as I'm coming through high school, I was into bands like uh, Iron Maiden. You know, we got wind of the Killers record, and I was into Priest. As I was getting to the heavier stuff from the ACDC into the hard rock of Aerosmith, into uh, Maiden, Priest, bands like that. And then, you know, you hear Metallica for the first time. You hear uh, Slayer for the first time. And I'm able to see Metallica in front of a crowd about as big as this. And I saw Metallica with Cliff. I saw, you know, Exodus, right when they were Forbidden, starting. Possessed. Yeah, all those Death bands. Angel. And so you see all your peers. I was telling the story <laughs> um, in high school. I was with my girlfriend at the time, whatever. And I'm not, a, you know, a big pothead or whatever. But for some reason, I smoked a little hash that night. And uh, I was seeing this band called Laws Rocket that I really liked. Laws Rocket, you know, they're big. You wear spandex, you know, it was 1983 because that's what you did in 1983. You know, Slayer was wearing spandex at that time, so. <laughs> And Slayer were opening. It's their first uh, Northern California appearance. So I'm sitting up against the side, and the band had to walk past everybody to get to the stage. So I'm just stoned, and I'm breathing too heavy, and everybody's looking at me, and I want to be in a closet at this point. But um, So I hear these, these spikes and all this noise starting to walk by, and it's them in their spandex, and they wore makeup at that point, too, right in the beginning, and nails and everything. And the theme from Halloween comes on and Slayer busts into Evil Has No Boundaries. Nice. And I thought, oh my God, I t must be totally stoned because these guys are playing faster than I've ever heard any band play before. And I instantly became enamored with just their aggression and their musicianship and this, just the ferocity of that band. And I wanted my band to sound like that. And so I joined a couple of guys that were doing some thrash stuff, and they were called Death Penalty. And we changed our name to Violence and wanted to be Slayer. Nice. What was your first show with uh, Violence? Um, we would play the local, there's a local joint called Ruthie's Inn where Megadeth and Slayer and um, bands like Exciter, Metallica, I saw Metallica at Ruthie's Inn. Shit. And uh, we'd play. Local, local stuff like that, and it was with a band called Forbidden Evil. And uh, we, they practiced around the corner from us, and um, we knew the guitar player was awesome. His name was Rob Flynn. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, the first thing we noticed is that he had a hot girlfriend, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we were about to get signed at the time, and um, I was writing all the music at the time, and I felt a lot of pressure. You know, I was 19 years old and looking at signing a deal. I mean, I'm sure you can understand yeah. that. You know, it's like Ugh, I got to write 15 songs, man. It took me 21 years, 19 years to Slightly write nerve seven. You know, <laughs> so, so uh, we wanted another writer in the band, and we kind of approached Rob as like, we want you to be in the band. We're not looking for a guitar player. We want you. Mm -hmm. You know, if he wasn't going to work out, then. We were going to keep the guy that we had and move on. But he wanted to be in our band. He was writing heavier stuff. And he had a song already. It was called Torture Tactics. I don't know if any Violence fan knew that song. But Rob had that written for Forbidden. And they were like, fuck, that sounds like a violent song. <laughs> you know? And so it was, a, it was a perfect fit. This is in the days when there was no such thing as pay to play. Right. Oh, there was back then. No, no, there wasn't. There wasn't. We got paid even, you know, a hundred bucks to play, and we, it we saw that evolve after. I never had to go through that, so it was pretty fortunate not have to do that. How many of you guys have done pay to play? Man, that's harsh. You know that makes me appreciate 
The scene, you know, the scene at that time was so special. You could go out three, four, five nights a week to the local places and see killer thrash bands or even rock bands or whatever. You know, it was just a different time. And till, of course, you know, the the people with the money figure out a, wheel, a way just to just screw you out of even more. You know, it's like, hey. So it's I I feel I feel sorry for having to go through that, but it makes you stronger, man. Twenty years later, we're all standing outside the whiskey trying to make sure we sell our tickets, right? <laughs> oh man, yeah. I don't. We didn't come down here and play that often, and you know, no no offense to everybody who's native from here, but I was never really a fan of the L.A. area playing shows just because of that. It's just really oversaturated and really really hard. The mm -hmm. Bay Area was was really like a family, you know, even with the club owners and everything. It was, we were really, really fortunate. And, you know, and we t of course we took it for granted, you know, having all those bands watching, you know, Testament and Death Angel and all those bands just flourish and being able to feed off each other and just say, hey, they're doing it. You know, we could do this as well. So one big happy family. <laughs> Not at all times. There was, there was a lot of, uh, competition and um, there was a lot of rivalries as well. Us and Forbidden, natural rivals. We stole their guitar player. You know, we right. had the same manager. It was a race to get signed first. You know, who's drawing bigger? Right. And um, you know, fortunately for us, we we were doing you know better in the Bay Area at that time. They did better over the world because they were able to tour. But such is life, man. How did Machine Head come about? Machine Head. Um, we were, it was 1991, Violence did a record called Nothing to Gain, and it was also about the time where Nirvana came out. <laughs> and great record, you know? And Soundgarden was getting big, and you know, everybody knows the grunge thing kind of came in and wiped Thrash out for a bit, for about 20 years, 25 years. And it was just, Violence was just beat. We were just beating a dead horse, and you know, Rob is such a guitar head. He's such a driven dude that he needed to be playing. He needed to be doing something, and um, he he and Adam at uh, the Day on the Green with Metallica, Queensrÿche, Faith No More, and Soundgarden said, "Hey, you know, hammered. Let's start a band together or whatever, you know." And he started a side project. He approached violence about it, and we were like, no, you can't do that, or whatever, and so he quit and joined it. And he formed it, and I instantly kept tabs on him and wanted to be in his band. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, um, violence the singer quit, and I uh, started singing. We were a four-piece. We tuned down like Machine Head was doing, and uh, we were called Torque, and uh, I sang on a record, and uh, it was good, man. I enjoyed being a front man. I wanted to try it once, and we put a record out. We went to overseas and played the Dynamo Festival and had a good time, and um, I did it. You know, it was something that I wanted to do. It was fortunate that I was able to do. I wasn't that good at it, but <laughs> it was, I was able to do it, you know. And uh, meanwhile, Rob is there getting signed and getting big, and. Um, I kind of dropped out of music for a bit. And um, I got tired of, hey, dude, look, you know, check out my demo type deal, because I'd done that before. And, you know, I was, you know, married at the time, and, you know, I was snowboarding and playing basketball and having a good time, golfing and having a good time just doing that and being away from it and uh, stepped aside. And meanwhile, Rob was doing his thing, putting the records out. More Things Change comes out, Burning Red comes out. And uh, after Logan quit, I kind of joked with, I go snowboarding with Rob and Adam sometimes, and hey, you know, I was gonna try out, and they, you know, eh, chief, yeah, right, type deal. And right. um, So I was about three years out of music, sold my gear for snowboarding gear. <laughs> And um, I get a call from a guy who's taking violence and forbidden and testament riffs and using Pro Tools and looping them all together and putting original riffs over them. 
and uh, he wants me to come out and write some riffs and put them down. And uh, so I say, okay. So I start writing riffs for him. He starts looping them and put them in. It's turning into original songs. He's singing on top of them. And I'm, technology and, and everything, dude, it's just, I just want to plug in, hit my stomp boxes and play, you know? So it's all above me. I don't even know. He's like, just play, playing riffs, sound good. He gets a, a V drum kit, right? That's the one that you plug in and makes all the different, that's not D drums, but it's V drums. Is that Roland. It? Yes. Rolling V drum. It's an idiot. <laughs> and so we get a drummer who was my last drummer in Violence at the time. He's the guy who played there at the end. He's my tour drummer. So we're getting original songs together. So it's, it's starting to sound like a Tool meets Fear Factory type vibe. And I'm, f I'm feeling it. It's nice being creative. And uh, we bring my buddy Shaq in on keyboards, and we get a bass player. We start playing live. We start drawing really well. The singer was this guy who uh, had an internet startup. He worked for Exodus Communications, and so he's got a ton of money. So he's buying moving lights, and we're in clubs, you know, and we've got these moving lights and <laughs> strobes and everything going on. So we're putting on a good show, and we're able to put a record out. And so my creative thing starts going again, and uh, Violence gets offered to do this uh, reunion show because Chuck Billy and Chuck Schuldner from Death are doing a benefit, and they're getting all the Bay Area bands back together to kind of do it. We hadn't played together in seven years, and so we did it. Anthrax played. It was a, it was a pretty legendary show for these guys. And so we get back together and just blow the roof off the joint. You know, it's just... Everybody's got, you know, ten foot hard ons going. Oh my God, we're you know we're back. <laughs> a little bit grayer, a little bit fatter, but <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, we do this violence reunion, and um, I get the call. We're we're doing some shows up and down, and so it's it's exciting to be playing again. And uh, I notice that I get uh, I'm online with Adam, do uh, ex guitar player or bass player, and. I Emming, because that was hot at the time. <laughs> AOL I Emming. And uh, Adam hits me, and I say, Yeah, I heard a ruse out of the band or something like that. And he's all, Yeah, that, that's right. I said, Do you have any dates lined up? And um, he says, We're doing two weeks in Europe. They're headlining some festivals, uh, they're playing with Slayer and some other cool stuff, you know? So it's like, ah, okay, I'll just wheel my gear over and join the band, you know? And he hits me back, he's all, okay, we'll be waiting for you. And I went, <laughs> <laughs> And I said, not kidding. And he's all, neither am I. So we, we kind of put it together that uh, was still married at the time, and I was, gonna do this as a last, last hurrah, you know? Do a couple of weeks with Machine Head, you know, quit music. I was pretty much at the end of my thing. My marriage was kinda on the rocks and it was just time, okay, this is, this is a good ending, you know? This is, who gets to shut their door with playing the Grass Pop Festival with Slayer and having Bruce Dickinson's band and Halford's band open for you and, you know, headlining a German festival in front of 30,000 people and, it was, uh, it was a good opportunity. So uh, rehearse for them and I go in and, and they're, okay, what do you want to play? You know, what do you want to play? And I said, well, these you guys name, name a song, you know? And they're all, I'm all blood for blood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all, oh shit, we haven't played that in forever, you know? So I rattle off a bunch of tunes and it was, it was really magical. Sitting down and, and playing with Rob again, for sure. I mean, we grew up playing guitar together and learning the guitar, and we did van tours together, and, you know, we, sp <laughs> we slept in the same bed together on tour for four months at a time. You know, we, Violence had two, two rooms, and there was eight of us. Were you so. the big spoon or the little spoon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I got about four inches on him, so... <laughs> You see how the math works out for you. <laughs> and we would wake up, you know, like, 
oh man, you gotta, you know, because we had a 70, 70 year old manager who had a bed to herself. So it was me and Rob and Debbie Abono, our manager at the time in the other bed. And she get up, you know, it's time to go to Omaha or whatever. And be, come on, man, you shower first this time, you know, because you got an extra half hour of sleep. Right. Fuck, I'm not, no, you, it's, well, we're not showering today, you know. It's, so it was us together again, and we were able to put all of the previous whatever. There was a period where Rob wouldn't talk about violence because he wanted to make Machine Head on its own, you know. And um, we were able to put that behi behind and uh, just enjoy jamming again. So we do the tour, and it's awesome, man. We're just killing it, just killing it. And there's this special chemistry on stage you know the band is just and, and people are aware of it too people are, are seeing it and, and knowing it so we finish the tour we go home you know and it's like it felt weird you know because we're separating and it's like okay cool you know see you guys thanks for you know whatever so i go home to retire and marriage goes to shit and it's you know it's like all right well i'm fucking joining machine head then <laughs> <laughs> And I'm so blessed, man, and I'm so fucking lucky that so I gotta apologize. I got custody of my son today. <laughs> so what I was saying, <laughs> I'm lucky, I'm so blessed to be able to do what I do and what was I talking about again? <laughs> <laughs> joining Machine Head. Yeah, joining Machine Head. So I'm, I'm lucky and blessed to be able to have this opportunity, you know, not only the one time, you know, because we had marginal success in, in violence, but um, to be able to have a second chance to come back and do it with, with the band that I always wanted to be in, you know, it's, it's all my riffs towards the end of violence and all the torque stuff was geared towards Machine Head, and now I can write... You know, I'm not getting my riffs thrown out for sounding like Machine Head because I'm fucking playing in Machine Head. <laughs> and they were writing Ashes at the time. They had about 75% of Through the Ashes of Empires written. And uh, I had some riffs come in. And, you know, the dudes were so welcoming and so... They, they didn't audition anybody in the, in the interim. There's probably like a three-month period in between that they were like waiting for me. Like they just, okay, we'll see ya. And when I came in, it was just like, the search is over type deal. I hear that Survivor song in my head. You know, the search is over. <laughs> but it was, it felt like family and it felt like home. Nice. Since you mentioned like some of your favorite, you know, that one, you know, what better way to go out with that? Like what are some of your favorite shows have you done? Um, Man, again, I'm so fucking lucky, dude. We have some, done so much cool shit, I can't even conjure it up. You know, we, uh, we played the Wacken Festival in 2009, and we headlined it. And uh, we had this falling out with the Sonosphere Festival. It's a, it's a touring festival in Europe, and they have, and, and this, it was a Metallica tour type deal. And we signed on to do the Sonosphere in London, or in, uh, We'll say in London, yeah. and uh, was it was Metallica, Nine Inch Nails, us, and then some other bands underneath, and uh, so we agreed to do that slot, and so we had, and then they freaked out for some reason. And they put Limp Biscuit above us, <laughs> and we like, and we were we came to the promoters going, you know, what the fuck, <laughs> you know, we we booked a f festival season around this thing. And they did that, and so we, we went back and forth, and they were basically, well, look, if you don't like it, then you can just not play. And we pulled out of the festival. And uh, after a bit, then we, 
you know, we were upset, we were hurt, and it was the wrong thing to do because a lot of Machine Head fans bought tickets to go see us at this festival. So they come back to us, oh, you know, there's a lot of backlash on Sonosphere. And like, oh, what do we got to do to, you know, and it was never about the money or any of that. You know, we did take more money from them, but, <laughs> Not a bad but thing. <laughs> and we agreed to play underneath them, but we just said, don't tell anybody that we're playing. We'll come back because of the, it was because of the fans because people were bummed out that they that we didn't do it and it hurt us to know that we had done that. So we we do the Wacken Festival and we made Sonosphere book us our own chartered plane, and so we have a, and it's it's like a decent sized commercial plane, you know, three and three, and so we we play Wacken and then they jet us off to the airport. You know, it's total rock star shit. It's fucking awesome, you know. <laughs> And so we, we get to the airport, and then they show us where our plane. We thought it was just going to be a little private charter, you know? And it's like this huge plane, and we're loading our gear on, and we're strapping it down with seat belts. Like, my guitar's got its own seat with a seat belt on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, like, the only people on this plane, and we felt like Iron Maiden, you know, except for Bruce wasn't flying the plane for us. And right. So we, we kill it at, at WAC, and there's 80,000 people going, and there's just, I mean circle the biggest circle pits that I've ever seen and we go right from that to going over and and just killing it over with Metallica and a Nine Inch Nails over that and and Limp Bizkit just got machine fucking headed into the ground <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> the hard life right oh dude it was so good <laughs> it was so good but we've we've headlined a festival in Poland in front of 600,000 people and um there was a show, my, my mom had never been to Portugal, and we were playing with uh, Metallica Slipknot and like Lamb of God, it was a sonosphere, that was that same, that same year. And uh, my father passed away about six years ago, and she's full-blooded Portuguese, so she never got the chance to be there, so I said, you're coming out to Portugal, we're playing with Metallica. And uh, so we flew her out there, and um, she's watching from the side of stage, and she's in our dressing room, and James comes walking in, and he's, we're, we're like, even, we did three tours with him, but every time James is around, you're like, holy fucking shit, that's James Edfield, it's so fucking cool. <laughs> I would agree, standing next to him at the Golding, I was like, holy shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's just a presence, you know, and, and he'll email me sometimes about hockey, you know, because I'm a Flyer fan, and he'll just give me shit about it, you know, and, um, but James is in our room kind of talking and she, you know, she's like, Hey, who's that dude or whatever. And so take him over and introduce her and take a picture with James and all the Slipknot guys and Robert from Metallica, you know, so she's pimping hard at the Sonosphere. <laughs> and, uh, so she's watching us from the side of the stage and before Halo, Rob talks a little bit. And so he, he got. 70,000 Portuguese people to, to give this big cheer for my mom. She comes out, I drape a Portuguese flag around her, we're like waving at the crowd and they're cheering her on and she's just losing, you can see where I get it from, right? Just, <laughs> yeah. And we're watching Metallica and we're the first ones on the side and so she's watching Metallica standing on the side of the stage and she had a friend with her and her friend just thinks that she's just the coolest 70 year old lady in the world at this point. <laughs> And Robert comes over in the middle of the show. Hey, oh, hey, Mrs. Stimmel, how's it going? You know, and that's fucking awesome. That was a good. Sh- that was a, that was a good show. Nice. So we're talking about all this cool stuff. Like, let's talk about the blackening. Like, what was the process of writing that album? Well, after Ashes, um, you know, Ashes was a big comeback record for us. Everybody had written us off after Supercharger had come out. Um, I thought I was stepping into this situation to where, oh man, you know, we're gonna, (laughs) they were talking about signing to Electra and you know, I'm coming into this situation, we've got labels, you know, batting down the doors and meanwhile, nobody wanted to sign Machine Head at this point. You know, we got turned down by every label there was and uh, unbeknownst to me, I'm just, I didn't care. You know, it's just, I'm in Machine Head now, I'm doing music for a living, you know, and we struggled to get a deal. So once we got the deal, put the record out, really put, you know, it was a heavier record. Um, I get way too much credit for like bringing Machine Head back for some reason. They're like, I was, I'm on the records that they like, so it must be me, you know? It's, right. I gotta set the record straight, you know? The Machine Head made a cognizant effort to become 
write for themselves, you know, the fuck, fuck writing radio singles, all this other stuff, they did. I came around at the right time. You know, I think I help in my writing style, but, you know, that's what put Machine Head back in the fans' map or whatever. Right. But that was the big comeback record. So following that up, it's like, what are we going to do now? You know, we took a year, about a year to write it, and we just riffed out. We riffed the fuck out. You know, there's three 10 minute songs on that record, you know, and it's unconventional writing, you know. We're the power of the riff compels us. <laughs> to do, we were compelled. It's like, what, why do we have to write a five minute song, you know? Where's the rule? Where's the rule? There's no rule. There's at no all. rule. So we did, you know, we just, we, you take a song like Halo, and it's a 10 minute song. Now, it's what we wanted to do was not only tell a story, but take you on a journey with the song, you know? We wanted to take you through all these emotions and, and dynamics and feelings, you know? We wanted you to be pissed off. We wanted you to fucking cry. We wanted you to beat the shit out of somebody or something, you know? We wanted you to affect you and to make you think and, and take you to some place where you hadn't really done it before, so... I'm glad you brought that up because I never forget listening to that record for the first time. That was my junior year in high school when I heard Aesthetics of Hate. I was like, holy shit, this is fucking angry. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was listening to the whole rec, at, you know, the whole record. Like, there's so much, like, there's anger. There's, you, like, you can tell there's depression. There's every sort of emotion in it. And it was just so raw. And yeah. to this day, that's actually one of my favorite albums of all time. Right on, man. Excellent. Was, yeah, you felt pissed, didn't you? Fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was given all the situations around in high school. I was like, fuck yeah. I was like, I was angry. You know, like, went home. And I'm like, at that point, I just discovered, like, playing in drop C. I'm like, holy shit, this is heavy. You know, I just kept fucking riffing out to that. You know, what was your reaction, like, when you guys found out about the Grammy? Ooh. <laughs> Dang. Not doing that again. Uh, <laughs> I found out about the Grammy, and uh, we were in, okay, I got to tell the story anyways, it's going to, okay, 2007, we're on the, uh, the uh, Black Crusade tour, we're playing with, we're headlining Trivium, uh, Dragon Force, Arch Enemy, and Shadows Fall are touring in Europe. We're playing in Italy, and uh, I have these bouts of, uh, they call it cardiogenic syncope. I have fainting spells sometimes. And um, I haven't had one in about five years at this point. And I'm on stage, we're playing, you guys know a song called Descend of the Shades of Night? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a song about death and dealing with death. And my father had been in declining health for a while. And so be on stage, I think of him sometimes, and you know, fucking in the middle of the song, be crying and shit. You can see how easy that happens. So, and so I'm playing the song and I pass out. And it's like, whoa, you know, wake up and like, hadn't happened to me in five years or so. And so I just chalk it up to just another episode or whatever and um, go to bed, wake up the next day. You know, something felt off, you know, during the night and stuff. So I just, I went to bed and woke up the next day. Hey, you guys have been nominated for a Grammy. You know, fucking awesome. You know, Shadows Fall, too. We were both there at the same, same time. So I call home, and uh, my dad was a diabetic. And he um, went to dialysis at a certain time. And so I call home to let him know, hey, you know, your son's been nominated. You guys are Grammy-nominated parents or whatever, you know, yeah. and left him a message. Uh, go to sleep. Wake up, because it's rock and roll, so you wake up at 5 p.m. <laughs> And uh, I wake up to voicemails from my sister saying, hey, you need to call home. And so, call home, dad died. And uh, he didn't get the message. What he did was went to dialysis and um, put the keys of the car on the dashboard and just went to sleep. He just passed, he just died right there. And so, Sad, sucked, played the song, I mean, played the show that night, you know, it's like, we're set up, gotta play, you know, we're not gonna cancel, you know, we dedicate to Sin to him, it was a powerful night, it was awesome. And 
Dave kept asking. He just was adamant. What time? What time did it happen? You know, what time did it happen? And we put the math together. It's when I passed out. And what an amazing way to say goodbye and to experience that. So, fucking hey, dude, this is turning into fucking not what I intended. <laughs> but what a, you know, another blessing, what, you know, to have him, you know, just say goodbye in that, that way. So the Grammy thing, it's just like almost a punch in the gut every time it gets brought up to me. Done. Because that's my, that's how I related to that story. And uh, so I took my mom and my sister to the Grammys and it was fucking so awesome, man. You're seeing uh, Jerry Lee Lewis jamming with, John Fogarty and Little Richard, you know, what, when does that ever happen, you know? And we're able to see that and have that experience and have my parents there and just celebrate it for him. So it was cool. We should have won. <laughs> right after we won, right after we won, thank you guys. Right after we won, Rob got a text from Carrie King saying, I'll take the Grammy, but you guys should have won. That's right. It was for our final six. Yeah. So. so that's my Grammy story. How many guitar players do we have in the room? All right, cool. I noticed some of your custom guitars are tributes to legends, such as you know Michael Shanker, Randy Rhodes. Like, can you give me a little more in depth about all this? What's that? Oh, Boondock Saints. Yeah, <laughs> sweet. Yeah, and uh, you know another blessing, man. I I consider myself the luckiest guy in the world, man. I get to do the coolest thing for the coolest band that I think, you know, we're successful at it. I'm able to make a living at it. You know, I've got the best wife that I could ever ask for. Round of uh, applause little, for that. <laughs> you know, the the best little boy, and you know, it's it's these blessings just keep coming. You know, I I play Jacksons. I have for you know pretty much my whole career since 1980, <clears throat> 1986. And uh, they, they came to me and they kind of joked in passing, hey, maybe someday we'll, you'll get you a signature or something like that. And I just grabbed it and I never let him go. I said, you told me one day, you know, when am I getting my signature? And <laughs> Meanwhile, you're holding Tempesta by the neck like, yeah. where's my signature? <laughs> nah, I wasn't Tempesta at the time. It was uh, this guy, John Walker, and I was just like grabbing him by his, you know, his pant leg. Come on, you told me. And they gave in. And uh, um, I remember Brian McDonald, the guy there, was just like a, a big violence fan, a big machine head fan. He really went to bat for me. And... Uh, we did the signature series, and everybody with Jackson was like, who the fuck is this Phil Demmel guy? Why is he getting the fucking signature <laughs> series? Which probably a lot of people were, you know? And, and it ended up being like their number one signature series seller for a while. Keep in mind, guys, Jackson is owned by Fender, so like you can just imagine how hard that process went to get the signature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a struggle, but you know, it was really redeeming for us to go and and watch us sell so many guitars and how people dig it because, yeah, it's on a Jimmy Fallon yeah. Capital One commercial. Somebody, yeah. He's playing, you know, the one with the music and he's got the hair thing on and, you know, 50% more buckaroos and then he's all 50% more, yeah! And he's got a wig on and playing my fucking guitar. How cool is that? It was during the time like when um, Death Angel got the commercial for Carlos Jr. and Dragon Force just did another commercial as well. Yeah, that's awesome. It, it, so it was like during all that time I saw it go down mm -hmm. with Blabbermouth. But about Shanker and them, I just wanted to pay tribute to the dudes that I really enjoy. I don't think that I sound like them, but Randy Rhodes, um, Michael Shanker were two of my absolute heroes. They had signature, I mean, not really signature, but they're you knew their guitars by the polka dots and by the black and the white, you know? And, and so I took my V's, my signature V's, and made that same kind of guitar. And uh, people, people dig it. Uh, the Michael Shanker one is, uh, we played Whackin' last year and Scorpions were playing and I had Rudolph sign the back of it. And then it was weird, I, Michael Shanker was coming through my area and I hit up like the promoter, hey, I want to get my guitar signed by Michael, you know, it's a tribute guitar. And, mm -hmm. and he's like, well, yeah, I'll hook you up with the tour manager. So the tour manager calls me up, big Machine Head fan. He's like, yeah, you know, we're going to have you come up and play Dr. Doctor with him. 
And I was strangling him through my phone saying, don't you fucking tease me about this, man. <laughs> and sure enough, they came through and Michael, you know, had me come up and play doctor, doctor with him. And more blessings, you know, more blessings. It's amazing. It's amazing. And so <laughs> I had a Sharpie in my pocket during the song. And so we're playing it. We end it. You know, I do the little shanker bop with him for a minute. And, and so he's over here riffing. I take the guitar, turn it over, take a pin out, hand it to him, and he's shredding on this hand and signing my guitar with the other that hand is at the awesome. end of the song. <laughs> so it's how it, you, you can't even make that shit up, you know? I got it on video, I got pictures of the whole deal, and I got the guitar sealed and put away. Not even on the wall, just put it away. It's just put away. Nice. What are you creating playing nowadays as far as amps and all that? Um, amps, you know, we. We love the PV 5150s. The old ones were, uh, were kind of using the latest in amp modeling devices, but they don't, you know, give us stuff for free, so I'm not going to plug them. I think we know what we're talking about. Axe FX? <laughs> yeah, we're using the fractals and part of our rig as well. So Things are so expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. But um, we enjoy, we do so much traveling and shipping that we like... Um, having the condensed cases, not taking the big head cases, the big cabinets. I mean, anybody see Machine Head when we had the big diamonds, the big nine cabinet diamonds, the set carts? Yeah, so these things are huge, you know. You need a trailer just for those, and now we just wheel, wheel the little carts on, and it's way better that way. And no back problems for the roadies. Yeah, right. Well, they complain anyways. <laughs> oh, my liver. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Let's get down to some label stuff. What are some of the things that young musicians should know when signing to a label or when they shouldn't? You know, it's so different these days. Anybody out there in a, in a band that's signed? Or, yeah? Okay. Um, how many record deal did you have to sign? How many record deal did you have to sign? How many record deal? Okay. Are you, did you make it through the end of it? Uh, yeah, by putting the live record out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you give them the, the greatest hits or a live record or something like that. You know, it's hard these days with the way the digital's going. And uh, I would focus on your material more than I would a label at this point. And, you know, you need good representation. You need somebody who um, a lot of the record deals and a lot of labels are doing 360 deals where they take everything from you. They take your publishing, they take your merchandising, they take fucking everything, and it's... Your touring budget. <laughs> yeah, well, you have to pay that back anyways. That's just a loan, you know? You're taking a loan from yourself to go on tour at that point, so it's... If, if you're in this to make money, you know, don't get into this, because probably not gonna make money. You know, chances are low that you're not, unless you do these startup deals where you do the Indiegogo stuff where you just, you know, you ask your friends for money. To <laughs> and you guys can do records on your own now. I mean, it's, it's, you just need people to get, it, get out there and see it. You can make deals with iTunes on your own, you know. I'm the f really, I hate the fucking record labels, too. I really do. I really hate the way that, that everybody just tries to take a piece of you and just kind of squeeze it out. And I'm just really embracing the fact of everybody doing things on their own. So pretty much fuck the record labels, yeah. But I'm sure we're going to sign to one. <laughs> actually, on that note, as far as Indiegogo goes, uh, actually Chimera was just doing the same thing. They just raised about over $30,000 to release the next record. That's amazing. Yeah. What are some of the rules, I mean, the do's and don'ts on being on the road? What would you say they are? <laughs> there's no rules on the road. But I'm pretty sure there's a there's couple no rules things. in Fight Club. <laughs> um, Technically, there is. Rule number don'ts. one is not talk about the Fight Club. So there is one rule. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do's and don'ts on the road. Has anybody here toured before? All right. Are there rules? No. Exactly. <laughs> What I would suggest is keeping a level head. You know, my first tour with Machine Head, I was getting hammered every night. Every night. And waking up and 
and just not being yourself. You know, you want to you want to be you want to be able to perform at your highest level. So, I don't drink before I play anymore. <laughs> Simply for the fact because I used to, and then I'd watch some videotape or get shown some videotape of me playing, and you're just not as good, man. I you know I don't by the fact that, hey, I'm better, you know, I'm a better driver when I drink a beer or whatever, you know? It's like, no, you're not. You're playing at your optimum. Your body knows it. So just, just have a good time and enjoy yourself. If you're fortunate enough to do a tour, just enjoy yourself. You know, have, be aware of everything that's going on. Don't take it for granted and just fork it. enjoy every minute of it. Funniest and worst experiences? Funniest. Funny experience on the road. What's that? Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> the last nights, the last nights of the tour are usually, you know, the the letting loose and just kind of pranking the other, the opening bands. And we uh, were on tour with Chimera, and it was the last night of the tour. And Rob has this alter ego, Rufus, <laughs> where somehow I don't know how he does it, but he talks us into getting into diapers. And uh, he puts on this big afro wig and shades and nipple tape. And he writes Rufus across his chest. And he becomes, I haven't seen Rufus in a while. To probably for a good thing. But, and then he talks us into, he, I, he's a persuasive guy, he is. <laughs> And we got in diapers, and we got out, and we totally freaked all of Chimera, like freak danced on them on stage. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this could also be my worst experience, because I, I used to do a lot of stage diving and, uh, until this night at Chimera, where I overshot the crowd. I would do a flip and land on my back. And except for this time, I was pretty hammered and ended in a diaper. And <laughs> ran across the stage, did a flip, and overshot the crowd and landed seven feet below directly on my back and felt something. It's like, that's going to hurt or whatever. And Speaking of diaper stuff, I, was, I think it was in 07. Do you remember? It was, it was you guys, Hell Yeah, and Bury Your Dead. I forgot who it was. Um, it was an Anaheim show. Do you remember the night? Where I think it was the drummer that literally wrapped his whole oh, leg yes. and did the the duct tape ti uh, diaper. Yes, that was the Barrier Dead guy. I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Oh remember. yeah, in Anaheim. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was don't ever do. That's a don't. <laughs> that's a tour don't. Don't duct tape yourself in the groinal area. <laughs> it was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Since you mentioned stage diving, first. First time you staged, though, if you can, you know, remember. Mm -hmm. I do. It was a, uh, it was my first head walk, and where you walk on the crowd, because I preferred to do that. That, that was a buck fifty back in the late eighties, early nineties. You know, I got thrown around pretty bad, so I'd rather get up on stage. And it was a band called the Exciter, nice. and they were a Canadian metal band. You guys know them? Yes, great band. Love that band. And uh, it was at the Stone in San Francisco. And I got thrown up, and I landed on somebody's shoulders, and I just walked on like three shoulders across, and then got on stage, got thrown off the stage, because I was a, a buck 50 soaking wet, and right. just landed on some dudes, and just nice. like was, fuck, amazing, all right. Then stage time. I had the same experience. I mean, my first time was for Municipal Waste. I'm sure you guys heard of them, right? Oh, yeah. uh, they're going to fuck you up. They did. They did. That's what they do. I went flying right as the confetti went out, too. Oh, that's awesome. What's your thoughts on the current state of metal? Any, what are your favorite bands? My favorite metal bands right now, um, we're on our way down here, and they're not a band anymore, so, but there's a band called The Haunted. Nice. Uh, and there's this record called Revolver that uh, um, Christian from Fear Factory auditioned for us yesterday. And I drove him down here today. So we were, we were just talking about, you know, records that get you pumped up. And we're talking about Vulgar and ba uh, 
records like that, but I just said, man, this fucking haunted record revolver just makes me just want to fucking just kill somebody, you know? And, and uh, the haunted, the Lamb of God is a band that I really enjoy. Um, I think that they are just riff machines and just a, a, a good groove machine. Um, who else do I like? Man, I like, radio, I like some radio rock bands like Seven Dust. And uh, I love the Shine Down record before this last one. With the um, white so, background with the birds? Yeah, with all the hits on it, you know. Sounds of Madness, Shine Down. This band called Non Point's really good. Metal bands, baby. Lazarus AD is a good band. Nice. Yep, yep. You know, the Ghost record. Ghost BC. Ghost BC, I, I really love the first Ghost record. And this last one, I haven't really given it too much of a chance because it sounds really too poppy and really not all the elements that I really liked about the first record aren't really there. But I enjoy Ghost. There's some gnarly tracks on that. I think uh, Body and Blood, um, definitely Monstrous Clock are some really good ones. In there. I'll give it a chance. You know, I'm going to lose all metal, metal credibility right here, but I'm going to tell you what I did anyways. Ghost was playing in San Francisco. And I have a guitar tech buddy of mine who was in town with the band he was in, and I went to go see his band, and it was Bon Jovi. <laughs> no, don't clap that. You guys should be going, fuck you. Yeah, but we had a great time. You know, He took us down into the bowels of Bon Jovi-dom and uh, went into his little, Marta got to, to look in his mirror, and you know, and this is where Bon Jovi does his makeup or whatever, you know, and... And, uh, bon but Jovi he has. A, uh, I was expecting Richie Sambora to be there, you know, because I, I love Richie Sambora, Richie Sambrero, I call him, or Sambuco. And he wasn't playing, but this guy Phil X was filling in. Has have you guys heard of him? He's awesome, right? So I'd never heard of him, and then I, I uh, YouTube him because that's what you can do these days, you know. When I was growing up, you'd have to trying to figure out Randy's leads. It's like tape. Oh, wait, was it did it, did it? No, you know, the tape. Now you guys got lessons and YouTube and all that shit. It's awesome. No wonder why you guys are so awesome. <laughs> but this guy, Phil X, it, I think he's like ADD or something because he just rambles and talks. Have you seen it? Yeah, and he'll play. He's just all over the place, man. The guy's. Check out Phil X. He's just hilarious. Just don't even put the sound up and just watch him go through all this stuff. And he's awesome. So yeah, what are we talking about? <laughs> Current favorite bands. Current other metal bands. Who else? What am I listening to? The Testament record's great. There are bros from back home. The past two rec The past two records have been really fucking good. Yeah, I like the new Volbeat record. You know, Rob Caggiano. That dude did a hell of a job on that. Holy album. shit. You know, I never really paid attention to his lead playing and Anthrax and stuff that he did, but he's fucking a ripping guitar player, man. Tasty, bendy stuff and just good structures. Rob Caggiano is a motherfucker. I remember watching him warm up, like, keep in mind, I used to work at ESP, and he was, like, back there, we were just, like, getting him ready for a video shoot, and this guy's just going at it, like, holy fuck, dude. Like, this, like you guys, this guy can rip. A keynote on that album actually is Room 24 with King Diamond. Yes. That's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. They just got a song with King Diamond, and it's fucking killer. It's very different. I mean, if you look at the whole record, I mean, with, you got that song, then you got Lonesome Rider, which is a little more upbeat, like two different spectrums. Yep. Ball beat's good. What else? Stone Sour record. I like Stone Sour. I like the second record, and then the fourth record. So they're, they're evensies. What's that? Kill Switch is, the new Kill Switch is good. I'm, I, I like seeing Jesse back in the band and seeing him do the Howard stuff. It was weird at first because you see Howard doing the Jesse stuff and it's going, oh, he's killing it. That sounds great. And now Jesse doing the Howard stuff going, oh, he's killing it. That's great. <laughs> so on that note, I guess we'll give it to one more question and then I'll let you guys start asking whatever you want. Current plans for Machine Head after Mayhem, you know, as a bass player, what... Is there any tours coming up? After Mayhem, nothing, no. No touring, no. We need to write this fucking record, man. You know, I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, starting on the last record on Locust, I really start 
started writing lyrics with Rob. I did a little bit on the blackening here and there, sprinkled some stuff in there, but really on the Locust, um, I wrote about 25% of that record lyrics and music-wise. On Onto Locust? On Locust, yeah. So um, the, the Locust concept was something that I came up with. Uh, the concept for the pyromaniac of uh, I Am Hell was mine. Right. Um, the Pearls Before Swine, the whole addiction thing. I said, I wanted a song that, you know, that doesn't end happy, you know. Just want it to be, you know, it's not the stairway to heaven. It's not a song of hope, man. There's no hope in this fucking song, you know. <laughs> Just make it metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm looking forward to getting down and writing some lyrics with Rob and, and especially writing, writing the music as well. No touring plans. October in the studio. Record's going to be out probably by March of next year. So, Via Roadrunner? What? Via Roadrunner? No, we got, we're not with Roadrunner anymore. Ah. Yeah, there's the Machine Fucking Head Live was our last Roadrunner release, and uh, we're fucking released. You seem enthusiastic about this. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm kind of nothing about it. It's the state of labels and everything these days. It's like we're in a unique spot to where, like, if you guys remember me talking about nobody wanted to sign us after a Supercharger, well, Everybody wanted to sign us after the last record. So it's, it's really redeeming to be able to pick and choose like which route we're going to go and kind of write our own ticket. We licensed the last three records, which means that we own the rights to them. We, we borrow money from the label, but we're not at their whim. We own, we own our music. We own our publishing. We own our merchandising. So um, if you're able to hold on to that stuff, that's, it's... it's it's your lives, so if you can, hold on to that for sure. Owning the Masters is definitely a huge thing. Yeah, I mean, look at Metallica. I mean, they were they were smart enough that we they own put the it in songs. We don't own the Masters yet. Oh, if I said that, I was I misspoke. Right. <laughs> okay, now we know. All right. Crap. You guys ready to ask some questions? Um, so I was at I was at LA Live. You know where the Staples Center is? Yeah. And. Uh, I was uh, at the ticket booth, and I noticed that your signature Jackson's in there. Yeah. Did you, did you donate that, or how that get That's in That's the Grammy Museum. Oh, yeah? No, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be there. You know? So I was, uh, somebody had taken, said that my guitar was in the Grammy Museum, and I thought it was on the inside. And uh, I was walking by, and it's right on the street, and I thought that was yeah. even fucking cooler. You know, it's yeah. like, everybody could see it here. And they spelled my fucking name wrong. <laughs> I went to the guy and said, hey, man, can I, you know, th that's my guitar. You know, he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. Jack off. And, <laughs> and I get out my ID to show it to him, prove it to him. And he looks at it. He's like, this says demo with one L, man. This ain't your guitar, you know. Oh, you, he was just, he was fucking with me. Of course he let me in. Cool, man. Hey. I'm a huge fan. What's your um, name? Malcolm. Malcolm. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, are you guys ever going to play Wolves live again? Yeah. Wolves. All right. Wolves is a song off of the Blackening, which is 10 minutes of just fucking riff soup. It's, it's all the riffs off the Blackening that didn't make it into another song, so we just put them all into one song. And not really. I mean, it's got good phrasing. But um, I did a clinic tour over in Europe. And I was playing that on there. So I, uh, at Machine Head rehearsals that we're doing now, we, uh, before we start writing, we'll go, OK, somebody bust out an old one. Doesn't matter. We're just going to try to get through it. You know? And I always throw out wolves. You know? Come on, let's do wolves. Awesome. I can see us playing that at some point. Okay. Cool. You know, whatever, whoever we get to play bass, you know, <laughs> that's a hard song to learn. So it's going to be not one we could just say, hey, let's just bust out Wolves tonight, you know? Yeah. Play it on Mayhem. Yes. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing about Mayhem, we're playing like 30 minutes or 35 minutes. So we joke around and go, yeah, that's fucking three songs. You got two songs left after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yep. Another 10 minute song. We, we opened, did anybody see us open for Heaven and Hell? All right, so how many? We played four songs there. <laughs> hey, if you guys have a question, go ahead and just ask. I could probably hear it, and I could just repeat it. What's up? Yeah. 
He's asking how do Rob and I come about writing the songs and making, you know, everything sound fucking awesome, he says. Well, we open a can of fucking awesome. <laughs> you know, Rob is really, really good at structuring songs. I, I come up with riffs, and I'll get halfway through some stuff. I know some stuff that goes together, but he hears a song in his head, and he hears the bass lines, and he hears the drum beats. And, you know, McLean's a great songwriter, too. You know, he's like the unsung hero for this band. You know, he wrote the Halo riff. That's fucking Dave McLean, you know? It got voted in Kerrang! like, top 10 metal riff ever, you know? And it's like, fucking the drummer wrote it. <laughs> so Dave McLean's awesome. You know, I put the harmonic in it for the record. But it's, it's his riff. But Rob is just amazing at putting stuff together. And the three of us each have such a different background. Dave listens to country and is really into Rush and stuff like that. And Rob's listen, he listens to hip. We all have our different little things that all kind of come together. And we just write these little journeys that you go on. And that's what we want to listen to, and that's what we want to play. So if people get it, and you do, and we appreciate that, you know, that's maybe that's why a lot of America doesn't get Machine Head, because they are too, you know, um, you know, what do you call it when you want it right now? Fucking, so, you no, know, something about gratific instant gratification. You know, they just want, to, just give me the hook now. You know, I want to be done now. Yes, good, great song. And we're just... We're not that way. That's how we write, so that's what we want to hear. Hit me. Yes. <laughs> that's right. That was at that hotel or whatever. Yeah. You were wearing a Machine Head shirt, and uh, my wife plays in a band called Bleeding Through. And so I came down with her. They were doing a pretty big show with over... There's like five bands playing. And you had a Machine Head shirt on, the diamond one, right? And, yeah, and like your girlfriend or your sister? Or I don't want to, you know... A girl <laughs> said, hey, he's a big fan. Come in and check his band out, you know, and went in there and watched you guys rock out. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> Love hate relationship. Yeah, yeah, there's a I, I won't ever play a message in a bottle live. <laughs> um, yes, <laughs> you know the Logan stuff, and if you're familiar with the first two records, uh, Logan Mater has such a weird style of playing, and it's so unconventional, and his solos are just, they're awesome. But I, sometimes can't wrap my head around it, and. And you know, Rob knows all the leads and everything. So some he'll he'll why aren't you playing the solo right? It's like fuck, man. I've because I can't. I don't get it, you know. And and uh, so some of the Logan stuff is just really trippy to me. But I love it. I think it's fucking great. Um, uh, the songs that we play live, I like. I think that everybody's a consensus of what songs we're not going to play. Um, I love playing Halo. I love playing in the presence of my enemies. That's. The reason why, man. He says, I love your solo on that. You know, it's like, that's, I love playing that lead in there. It's one of my favorite solos. You know, there's a song called A Farewell to Arms off the Blackening. Yes. That is epic and huge. And, you know, the running joke with me in writing, like, the Blackening stuff was um, Halo got written and it's like 10 minutes. And, you know, I love Farewell to Arms. It was already a 10 minute song. And I said, you know, about Halo. Yeah, we'll probably never play that song live anyway. Surprise. Every show we've played Halo. But Farewell to Arms is a song that doesn't really go over as well live, but uh, is something that I like to play.
Yes. Okay, we have a song on Locust called Darkness Within. Slow, acoustic kind of song, and uh, something completely different from Machine Head. And um, I had a solo written, kind of written for this, for this piece. And there's a, anybody familiar with the song? Okay, so there's a part right after the solo that kind of sounds like Paint It Black. And it requires this string to ring out. So I had my solo already done, and Rob takes the first string, and we tune and drop B. So that's a C sharp. And he drops it down to B. And I said, motherfucker. <laughs> you know, you're, I'm locked in that pentatonic box, you know? And he's taking that one step and putting it down way over here, you know? And so what do I do with this solo now? And so I, um, I adopted this kind of just one-handed uh, pickless thing that I do. I bend up and, and drag it down, and, and it was something that really worked for me. So there's a solo in This Is The End that has a part in it where I take my picking hand and I reach over and mute the notes over like this and I just run an arpeggio down. You know, you can just just kill it over there without you know having to pick anything, you know, and it just kinda it just kinda opened that whole world to me. So it's that love hate thing I have with Mr. Flynn. Halo, that's a, that's another thing he did. On the Halo solo, he changed the key that it was in. So you guys know Halo? Okay, guitar solo in the beginning, it stops. Okay, I did that on an open string. You know, not picking anything. All the way up the open string. It looks flashy, it looks way better. He changes the key so that open C sharp now is not the key of the song anymore. So now I have to run it, you know, and pick it all and do it live, and it sounds different, and I was just cursing Flynn's name again. <laughs> Fucking Flynn! One more. What's that? I was so scared you were going to ask me about this. <laughs> right on, man. We appreciate that. Right on. And, and again, Bro, thank you so much for trying out. You know, I really, it, it takes a lot to be, you know, to do that, put it up, you know, if, you're, if, you're, you, if your thing was public or whatever, it takes fucking tremendous balls, dude. So thank you. Steve-O, any online questions? Take off your dress, man. <laughs> All right. No questions online? All right. Fuck, let's do one more. What's Fine, up? Fine, two more. <laughs> it's awesome, man. You know, one thing that I really wanted to bring into Machine Head was, uh, you guys are familiar with Death Angel, because I know I can see you guys nodding every time we say something old school trash. So it's a man <laughs> called Death Angel from the Bay Area, and their singer, Mark, and the guitar player, Rob, fucking have this huge bond on stage where they just, you, you just feel them feeling it. You know, they're rocking out and they're jamming with each other, and it's just like, man, I dig that so much when a band does that. And I wanted to incorporate that with the band, and so there's certain moments where, where we do that. So playing, trading those solos back and forth. And, you know, sometimes it happens when we just fucking hate each other, you know, that we're just having some stupid argument during the day. But we get on stage and we just, and all that goes away. And you just feel that, you feel that solo in Halo when we're together, you know, and the big note at the end and the Iron Maiden drum roll, doot, 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 you know. Fucking, I, get, I got chills right now just thinking about it. It's the best job in the goddamn world. You're not gonna be rich, but fucking, you know, it's amazing. Follow your dreams, man. Follow your dreams. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. So Rob, 
he's asking about a song called Who We Are and why we chose to have the kids singing in the beginning. Um, Rob wrote that song while he was had a little acoustic and he was trucking around his house and singing these chords and he heard his kids singing along to a Green Day song and you know he has these just these sonic visions or whatever that you know this is what I'm hearing in this spot right here and and uh, yeah, there's trumpets there too that's what I question more than the kids <laughs> fucking voices. but you know uh, having the kids do that was just something that he heard and I thought that that was kind of special that um, my little boy sang on it too. We kind of flew his vocals in because he was just really shy. And and sometimes I listen to his take of it and it's like, this is who we can't. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's, you know, something that we have as a kind of a scrapbook kind of snapshot in time too, you know, having our family do that. And songs about kind of just, not really rebellion, but just... This is we're it's a brotherhood, you know, and this is this is what we do, and we're we're all the misfits and we're all the outcasts, and you know, nobody can take this away from us. Cool. <laughs> <laughs>